All right, hi everybody and welcome to today's webinar, the latest in our Sage Talk series, how to improve your teaching evaluations by using the Socratic method and essay exams. So let me start by introducing you to our speaker, Stephanie Girard. Stephanie Girard is a professor of criminal justice at Chippensburg University in Pennsylvania. Before teaching, Stephanie was a trial attorney in the US Navy JAG Corp, worked at the US Department of Justice, was a federal prosecutor and a federal public defender, and ended her litigation career defending poor people facing the death penalty. Steph has also served on her campus promotion committee for a number of years and is very excited to share with you some classroom tips to secure better teaching evaluations on the way to tenure and promotion. Before we get started, I wanna let you know that this one hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We will be sending out a link to view it and to access the slides to all registrants in the coming weeks. If you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. At the end of the webinar, we will have some time for a Q&A from attendees, so please also use that Q&A box to ask any questions to the speaker throughout the webinar. Please also take note of the webinar hashtag, hashtag Sage Talks, and feel free to ask questions or leave comments there. We'll do our best to get through all the questions answered, but if we are not able to get through all of them today, we will allow Stephanie the opportunity to respond to those offline and we'll include a link to the answers after the event. Without further ado, let me turn the mic over to Stephanie Girard. Thank you all for joining me today in my presentation about teaching evaluation, something that of course is important to all of us. And I absolutely am looking forward to entertaining all of your questions and hope to get to answer them. As Jillian mentioned, I was a long time trial attorney before teaching. And when I came to Shippensburg, I had no idea about how the academy actually worked. And what I'm about to share with you is some great advice I've been giving, what I've learned through trial and error through uh, my many years of teaching, and how to navigate your career through teaching evaluations, especially if you have a heavy teaching load, as we here at Shippensburg have a 4-4 load. Now, our publication requirements are not as heavy as an R1 institution, and I myself have met my publishing expectations by writing a criminal law and procedure textbook with SAGE, which is how I was invited to present today. But I have actually taught a variety of courses, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. I've also taught eighth graders in summer programs. I've taught high schoolers. I'm an adjunct at a private law school. And although the content changes through all the courses I teach, my teaching and my classroom expectations do not change. Now, as I mentioned, when I first started teaching in 2003, I didn't know anything. So I did just what my predecessor did. I used publisher provided PowerPoint slides in class and I used test bank multiple choice questions. And when I got my first teaching evaluations, they were on average 4.7 out of a 6.0 scale. And I noticed that some scores were decidedly lower than that. So that's when I started actually paying attention to the evaluation questions. And my first piece of advice to you is you have to know what your evaluation questions are. Now I've provided the six questions that we use here at Shippensburg, and they may or may not uh, be similar to what you use at your institution. But uh, I'm confident that the subject, the content of what uh, the administration is trying to get from the student is basically the same. And that is, are you willing to answer questions and assist students? Uh, do you use examples and practical applications in class? Uh, this is an important one for us. Number three, do we encourage students to analyze, interpret, and apply class concepts? Number four, it was always the lowest and, and still is for me. The professor provides feedback on exams and assignments, and I'm gonna tell you what I've done to try to correct that. Uh, are the course requirements explained 
And the most important question is number six for us is, how effective are you? Were you effective teaching the course? I also study, started uh, to study the student comments that often accompanied these numbers. Uh, and we have sort of these forms that students can fill in either online. It used to be, uh, they used to fill out pieces of paper. And when I first started teaching, uh, I noticed that students had many complaints that my class was unfair because of my over-reliance on multiple choice tests. They said the questions were too tricky, which of course they had to be to discriminate between the A, the B, and the C grade. Uh, they complained the multiple choice questions didn't test material that we covered in class or in the book, and that the four or five answers that were provided uh, were often unfair. And I also noticed that when I used PowerPoint throughout the class, where I thought uh, the students needed to get certain information, and so it was on a slide and they could write it down, I noticed that students were so intent on writing down everything on the slide that they actually weren't listening to me. They weren't listening to the lecture. So I would put a slide up, the students would start to write, I would ask a question, and the student I called on always asked me to repeat the question because they were so busy writing, they didn't hear me. Not only that, there was a lot of dead time in class because some students were slower than others in writing the material on the slide. I wanted to make sure that everyone got it, so we would just wait. And the classroom environment itself was like a tomb because I had often dimmed the lights to make it easier for students to see the slides, so it was just dark and there was a lot of dead air. And I discovered that I myself started not to enjoy coming to class so much. The students often asked me if I could post the PowerPoint slides uh, to our course management system before class to make note taking easier for them. But I was resistant to doing this. I was reluctant to do this because I thought that they wouldn't come to class if I actually gave them the material beforehand. But over the years, I realized that students don't come to class for the PowerPoint slides. And some students won't come to class regardless of the slides. So I now upload them all at once for the entire semester. And what I started to do uh, in addition to that is I started only giving essay exams and I started to rely more heavily on the Socratic method, calling on every student, every class, and forcing students to engage with me and the material, which really, even though it was a lot of upfront work to make this change, eventually made teaching easier. Because once you get all of the students involved in talking, it relieved me of carrying the entire lecture. And the Socratic method, by calling on every student every day, allows you as the instructor to build relationships with the students. And you're modeling that everyone's voice matters. And I find that students tend to respect you more. They respected what I was doing in the classroom more. And they were more willing to take risks to give me their best work. They were at least less afraid to make mistakes um, in learning the material because there was this sense that we were all in it together. And so, as I mentioned, I got rid of the multiple choice in the essay exams. And uh, what I found was that in only giving essay exams, the student either knows the material or doesn't. And even though students have different learning styles, uh, my colleagues often offer a variety of assessments to capture students' strengths and weaknesses. For example, a test might have some multiple choice, some short answer, some essay. I have found by only giving essays that when students focus exclusively on the reading, the analyzing, and the writing skills of essay exams, their skill set improves tremendously. 
I have never had a student fail because they could not master the essay exam format. And the students responded positively. I, the comments about the fairness of the class went away because they either performed to the best of their ability or not. And especially in an essay exam, it can be very fluid because you, uh, one student might give an, a, an answer that is completely different from another student, but as long as they hit the main points that you've covered in class, they can get the points. And so not only did my, my teaching evaluations, my numbers went started to go straight through the roof and that's where they stayed. And on this slide, this is a, a chart that I made uh, when I went up for full professor that showed sort of the variety of classes that I had been teaching. Uh, my average, and this was for our question, encourages students to analyze, which again is both directly tied to the Socratic method and the essay exam method. And I was uh, far above the university average um, and some even getting some perfect scores. And uh, student comments were equally as effusive. Uh, the student said, oh, geez, I should, I should offer a course to all other professors in which I instruct them how to teach. Uh, student, this is a constant refrain. I've learned more in this class than in any other. Uh, students appreciated getting everyone involved in the lecture because I'm sure as in your experience, uh, sometimes we, we just call on those students who raise their hands over and over. It's easy to do that. They're enthusiastic. They usually sit up front and they always want to participate. But what I have found in talking to students is uh, they, it, it destroys morale in a way because uh, they sort of dominate the class discussion. Uh, and when the instructor doesn't get everybody involved, um, uh, it doesn't matter that the other students are in class other than the ones who are constantly raising their hands. So getting everyone involved makes learning more interactive and engaging. Um, even though they were resistant to the only giving, uh, only taking essay exams in my class, what they mention over and over again is it forces them to learn the material and not just recite the facts and forget it, which they often complain about multiple choice. And again, awesome teacher. I've learned more from Gerard than any of my teachers combined. Uh, and this uh, is also for graduate students that I teach. Uh, they too, uh, they just uh, think it's better to uh, engage with the material uh, through the Socratic method and essays rather than memorizing. Um, uh, they learn more in my classes than in five of their other classes, and I learned so much in one semester. So now it becomes, how do you get there? Uh, uh, how is it that you can learn to do this? Uh, and anyone can do it. As I said, it just takes some patience with up, uh, with uh, front loading the material. Uh, that the students will eventually digest and in practicing how to stay in the silence when you call on a lot of different people during a class. So I first want to start with some general tips for classroom management uh, because it's very important to come out of the gate uh, showing that not only are you in charge and in control of the classroom, but that it is a collaborative effort and that you expect certain things from the students. So uh, for example, on my first day of class, I never just give out the syllabus and go over it and then let them leave. I don't do that. Um, I keep them the entire class time. Um, I let them know that in, in my classes, they're gonna get their money's worth that every class that we have together is going to be a good use of their tuition. They're paying for the class time and I'm going to deliver it. Um, and so I have them, obviously there's, we don't cover content during that first class, but I have them get in groups. I have them do icebreakers. And that way we start building relationships from the inside out, not the outside in. 
You let the students sort of take responsibility, even though they hate icebreakers. Um, the way I explain it to them is I explain, I'm the captain of the ship, of course, f forgive the pun, but they're the crew and the boat doesn't move unless everyone works together. So even though you'll get students who are reluctant and they just sit and they're shut down, they eventually will participate um, because their other students are participating and they don't want to seem like they're, they're sort of the outlier. Um, and so that's how the first day is. And I really start to try and learn their names. And the way I try to learn their names is, uh, I don't know about you, but I always have in every class, I have like five Taylors and 10 Dillons, I can't, I can't remember their names like that. So for the first three weeks of class, every time I call on a student, and I said, I call on every single one of them every day. And again, this, this presupposes you have a, a class that isn't over 100 people, but I'm gonna talk about though, um, a method for those of you with large lectures where you can't necessarily do this every class. I have them, every time I call on them, I have them give me my, their full name. Uh, Dylan Thomas, um, Taylor Swift. I have them do that because it's just easier to remember um, uh, over time. And over time, I may call someone by their first name or their last name. I tell them, you know, don't take it personally. It's just a way for me to remember. But it, again, it forces the student to, to do what you ask because I get a lot of students who don't want to do that. They'll just say, oh, my name's John. And I, and I say, remind them gently. I would like your full name so that I can remember. And again, this is just establishing that you have certain expectations for their behavior. Uh, so when you get to the Socratic method, um, uh, they will respond. Okay, so another piece of advice, general classroom management. I read this somewhere. I start every class with the student talking in front of the class. And this piece of advice was because it gives students focus uh, uh, because they're very interested in what their peers are saying, and so they direct their attention to the front of the class. Now, what I do, I do news of the day. Um, I give a random assignment. Every student has a, has a, a day to perform. They come up in front of the class and, with no notes, and they tell us about a recent news story that they found on the web, and they connect it to the chapter under review. I don't let them use notes. Because I don't want them in front of the class reading from a piece of paper. And usually this is very easy to do. It's no more than a minute or two. I usually stand next to the student to give them moral support. After they're done, we all clap for their performance. But this is at least, the student knows it's not going to just be me droning on and on at the beginning of class. They're going to actually uh, see one of their own. Um, as I mentioned, upload your PowerPoints beforehand. Uh, as I have found, it absolutely does not affect uh, class attendance. And it's important, as I say, to call on every student, uh, every class. Now, how do you actually do it to use the Socratic method? Uh, there are some basics. Uh, you should require students to bring the reading material or their books to class because you always want to have a backup when starting the Socratic method to allow the student to at least uh, be able to have a fallback if they can't answer your question to read a passage or something from the book um, out loud. Now, I know that many students can't afford books, and I know some students have e-books, and you know, they bring their computers to class. Um, it's, if you can plan ahead of time and you know which passage of the book or the reading material you plan to uh, highlight during your lecture, you can make copies ahead of time. And for those students who don't have any reading material in front of them, you can put it in front of the student and ask them to read it. Because again, if, if the questioning goes awry, uh, you wanna have a backup plan. Uh, the basics of the Socratic method, uh, perhaps you've seen this, it was made infamous in the movie, The Paper Chase in 1973, ancient history for most of us, or more recently, it was uh, in the movie On the Basis of Sex that dramatized uh, Associate Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's years at Harvard Law School, her first year at Harvard Law School. Uh, the professor asks a question, asks a sort of, it's a general question, and then the professor dives deeper uh, with more questions 
uh, to illuminate the, the sort of nuances of the material. Um, that works on a law school level. It doesn't necessarily work uh, for undergraduates. For undergraduates, it's usually reversed. It's usually you have to start with a specific question about the class material. And if the student cannot answer, then you ask more general questions to ensure that the student answer you. So for example, uh, let's just say uh, lots of students haven't done the reading. Okay, so, uh, and I have here, this is a policing example from a policing class uh, that I taught once. Um, uh, and I'm gonna ask a specific question. Name one of Robert Peels, he's the father of modern policing. Uh, what are his, name one of his principles of policing? That's a very specific question. Uh, student doesn't know. Now it's very important that you not move on at this point. You don't move on to the student who's raised their hand and who knows the answer. Because one of the tricks I learned as a trial attorney, particularly in jury selection, you know, which happens in a big group. When you ask a juror a question in a big group, you know, what do you think about, you know, mandatory minimum sentences? Or you know, what do you think of the insanity defense? How that one specific juror answers educates all the other jurors how to answer, either good or bad. They're either going to answer in a way that you want because they want to get on the jury. They're going to answer in a way that you don't want to get off the jury. They're, every question you ask, all other potential jurors are learning from that answer. And this is the same principle using the Socratic method in class. How you handle one student's uh, inability or initial refusal to engage and answer educates every other member of the class. So I know, give me one of Robert Peel's principles of policing. Student says, I don't know. Can't, you cannot move on because then everyone will say, I don't know. So then you ask a more uh, general question, one that's less specific. What's the role of police in society? Now, most people can answer this, but I find that some people, and again, many undergraduates are anxious um, and they, uh, they, sometimes shake in fear at being, you know, uh, uh, called upon. This is a very, you know, it's a, it's sort of an intense experience at the very beginning because they're just anxiety ridden. Um, and so you may not even get an answer from that. Give me the role of police and society. I don't know. They say I can't, can't answer that. Um, you go into uh, a more general uh, question. Give me an example of what you've heard of police actions in the news. Now, again, generally people have heard about police action in the news. Uh, um, and if they still are frozen, uh, you ask, you know, something generic. Uh, why did you decide to study criminal justice? What did you hope to get out of this class? What did you, what have you learned in this class? What do you hope uh, to do after you graduate? Something that's uh, more, I, I, I don't ask for personal opinion because personal opinion tell, tends to get the class off, um, off the, the subject at hand. I mean, there is a time and a place for personal opinion, but not necessarily when I'm trying to uh, teach content. Um, and also what I often get, and this is very important, is sometimes you'll get students when you call on them, they'll say, I'll ask them the question, give me, what is the role of police in society? They'll say, I don't know how to say it. Like, I know the answer, but I don't know how to say it. To those of you listening, trust me when I tell you it is okay to just stay in the silence. I often tell students when, we're, when, I, when they respond to me in that way, well, I know what the answer is, I just can't say it. I say to them, it's okay. You're gonna reassure them. This happens to people all the time. We're gonna sit and wait for you to collect your thoughts because it's very important for you to push through and to be able to articulate what you're thinking. This is what separates uh, someone with a college education from someone who doesn't sometimes. It's not necessarily the knowledge base. Some people who never go to college are the smartest people on the planet. But this 
sort of pushing forward, pushing through obstacles is the hallmark of a college education. And what that does for the other students as you do this, that you're not, you're, you're going to be relentless. You are not moving on until a student actually says something, is it lets them know it's okay uh, to sort of take the time and come up with something and you are not moving on until the student uh, actually gives you something in response. Then what happens, and again, and, and for the last question, like, what, you know, what did you expect to get out of the class or what have you learned about the class? If the student doesn't answer at that particular point, they really do look foolish. Like I've, I rarely have had that happen, but it's clear the student is is not is you know not wanting to participate and uh, because everyone's sort of looking at them what do you mean you don't know you know what have you learned in the class or something like that like it it clearly then becomes something where they just simply don't want to participate and and there's not much more that you can do with that but if you follow these steps of something specific less specific less specific general 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 and waiting until the student gives you something, you will find that the next student you call upon will give you an answer much more quickly because they know that any stalling techniques or diversionary techniques to get you to get off of the student isn't going to work. And then it becomes so much easier. They participate much more readily when you call on um, on everybody and 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 again for the first weeks the class list is your best friend i you know i call everybody i highlight their names and everybody knows that they're going to get some sort of scrutiny um and so uh they participate much more readily the other thing i'll do on the socratic method is i will ask a student, like I'll say to, let's say Pete, I'll say to Pete, you know, what, what's the role, let's just say, uh, what's the police, the role of police in society? And Pete will say, well, it's to protect and serve. Part of the Socratic method is to take what Pete says and then use it with Sally. So um, Pete says, oh, protect and serve. And I'll say, Sally, Pete just said, to protect and serve. And usually the students are always amazed that I remember their name and I use their name when I talk about them because again, it holds their interest. They hear, they hear their name. Uh, Pete just said to protect and serve. What do you think about that? Can you give us an example? And when Sally gives an example, I'll have the class write it down as sort of part of the class notes. Boy, Sally just gave a great example. Everybody write this down. It becomes part of what I test on. It becomes part of the course material and the students invariably feel a sense of ownership and pride that what they've said, even if it's in the most inarticulate way, is good enough and it's part of our collective learning and they, once they have ownership of it, they become much more motivated uh, to, again, give you the best work that they possibly can. Now, what do you do, of course, if you have a large lecture hall? And I've lectured in these halls, 500 people, you know, 300 people. Obviously, you can't call on everybody every day. And I even do this when I have other classes where uh, I have a performance-based um, activity. So, for example, I teach mock trial and students have to perform in front of the class. I don't give assigned dates for these types of performances because what I find is if if um, uh, one student knows they're going on Tuesday and another student go knows they're going on Thursday they check out when they're not performing and some of them even skip there's no reason to even come if they know they're not performing I use what's called the magic cup and I cut up the class list their names and I put them all in the cup and I never give a date um, when I'm going to, to, when you're going to perform, or in a larger lecture, um, all your names go in a cup, and I will pull it, pull your name from a cup. Now, when you do it this way, everybody has to always be ready because they don't know when they're going. Of course, the drawback, which is obvious, is once you've pulled them from the cup or once they have performed, well, then they can check out. But then it's less, you know, it's, it's less likely that they will. Um, and uh, as long as they don't know who's going to be called when, 
they everyone has to be ready to go. And I, I found this to be very effective. And so those of you with larger lectures. So what do you do now? Um, as I mentioned, you know, you've cemented the material in their mind with the, the Socratic method, they've been engaged, you've got them to at least read something. If they don't have any answers, everyone knows they have to at least speak out loud. What happens? Then it's the it's the method of only giving essay exams. Now I know, and my colleagues know, and I mentioned to you, I, we have a 4-4 load. Everybody says this is impossible to do because of the workload that we have and the number of students that we have. But trust me, trust me, once you, once you get into the habit of doing it, you'll find that you'll enjoy it more, and even though students are initially resistant to it, they actually appreciate it at the end because many comments that I got on my student evaluations, my teaching evaluations were, Professor Gerard, even though my grade won't show it, I learned so much in this class. And they learned so much in it because they were able to express themselves. Now, uh, for those of you who are not criminal justice professors, there's a concept called procedural justice. And procedural justice is a concept that they first coined studying civil lawsuits. And what they found in these civil lawsuits is that the litigants could feel okay about an outcome. They could feel okay even if they lost the case, as long as number one, they felt listened to, and number two, they were treated with respect and dignity throughout the process. And what the whole basis of essay exams does is it gives students procedural justice. It's like they're being heard for what they know, for what they can communicate. Again, it's a, they somehow shaky at the start, but by the end of the semester, they're really, uh, they're humming right along. Even, even the students who were, who were traditionally weak students, they feel that they're, that they, it's, it was fair regardless of the grade, because of their, they were able to show their ability rather than filling in bubbles on scantrons. So it's, it's, um, it's intense at first in terms of your work, but if you do it over time, it just absolutely gets that, that much easier. So, uh, of course, it, you reduce grading time by creating a rubric. Uh, the rubric is so you can then use, and I have an example coming up, it's sort of you can just do a check mark. Um, if you're lucky enough to have graduate students to be able to do this, you can uh, give them the grading rubric. It also allows students to find out where they have gone wrong. One of the major problems that I've had and I still have when I teach online. I do use some multiple choice online because it's just that's the format. Uh, distance education, you can't, the, the essay in that format uh, tends to be less effective because we're not, I'm not able to use the Socratic method and have these relationships to build this type of knowledge base about the content. Um, but one of the things that students complain about is they never know where they went wrong. So if you, obviously you can't give scantrons back because if you tend to use the same multiple choice exam over and over, they can't, you can't give the students the answers. So if you don't go over the exam in a way that allows students to figure out where they make mistakes and so they can improve upon them for later exams or a comprehensive final, they get very, frustrated and they're going to take out that frustration on your teaching evaluations even though that isn't necessarily fair so the basic concept of the using essay exams that is fun for you and eventually for the student is you just take general principles from class whatever your class is and you choose new stories current or not for the students to analyze and then apply the principles and you can have fun creating creative hypotheticals. And what this does is, of course, it brings the real world into the classroom, which we all talk about that we, you know, that we like doing. And it, it's never stale. It's never stale for you. 
and the students have to really know the material because it's not like we he, here at SHIP, we have a lot of fraternities and sororities and many of them sort of save old tests. They have like test banks. And so you see that uh, there's a lot of regurgitation of certain uh, test questions that the students know about. But when you're using current events, uh, you can minimize the impact of, of those types of activities. So here is something, it's just a, uh, an example from an introduction to criminal justice class uh, that I taught. Um, I scanned the news, I found something about prostitution. Of course, we all know sex sells, but uh, it's a serious issue and uh, students' attention really is on, and their activism is really on stopping human trafficking. And there's much more awareness now that sex workers uh, are not criminals, um, that many of them got into the trade as young runaways, and um, and that there's uh, obviously a, 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 a sense of, of victimhood uh, in prostitution, not, not all the prostitutes, but for a great many who, who were recruited into it. And so here, uh, there was a quote that this prostitute was talking about. It was talking about legalization or is, should it be decriminalized? These are all issues that interest students and that they debate and they often have uh, strong personal opinions about. And um, then I ask them incorporating, and I have these facts and figures and class material, uh, and I say, answer the following questions. Um, so here I have this little, uh, uh, this, this thing from their book, and I talk about the people that we've discussed, Locke, Marx, Foucault, Bacara, and I, I tell them to propose a criminal law. Now this is very broad, and your rubric can be very equally as broad. Um, as long as they hit one of these, or some of these, they're going to get points. They don't have to get it all. but it engages their minds um, to come up with something based on the class material to respond to the issue. Um, the second question, I just completely made up. I said, oh, this hooker claims abuse. Uh, we'll get away with murder because we were discussing framing in the news media. And I'm asking them to talk about what frame it is and at least give me one criminal defense. And this is what the rubric looks like. It's 10 points if they gave me something. And this is this is where most of the work giving essay exams comes in, comes from. It's doing, I do the rubric essentially simultaneously as writing the exam um, so that I, I can just check mark when I actually get their exams. I use blue books, um, which of course, uh, you know, they're sold at our bookstore and um, the students can write as much or as little as they want, but it forces them to sort of watch the clock and and I and I assess essentially how they're doing. Um, you'll see, I, I wanted to point out that on my rubrics that I give back to the students. I give it back to them so they know where they messed up and where they can do better, where they can improve. You see here, because my lowest scores on my evaluations are on feedback, I have concluded that really nobody knows what feedback is, or that feedback, the word, is subject to many interpretations. Who knows what feedback really is? Now, I don't have time to give feedback to every single student. They just simply don't. So what I do is when I give this rubric back to the students, and you see I have their professor feedback on exam, I'm mirroring the language that's in my class evaluation. I, I say, take out your pens. Write this down. I'm giving you feedback, 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 feedback. I'll say it like eight times. And then I'll give some general feedback. Like you need to study, um, you know, the purposes of, of law more closely. You'll need to study, um, most students didn't get all nine principles of policing. Write that down. You'll need, this is my feedback for you. Feedback, feedback. And, and even though it is still my lowest score, I, it's clearly not as low as when I didn't do this. So um, these are things uh, to mention in terms of teaching evaluations. I should mention this at this point. We have gone from complete paper to online. And we have a way, even though the, uh, the teacher evaluation process is anonymous, uh, that is, I don't know, you don't know who writes what comment. Um, we do get a, um, a way to track the response rate. 
So towards the end of the semester, when teaching evaluations are out, I will pull up the response rate for the class. I will give an extra five points of extra credit. And some people don't, don't believe in this. But uh, I'm, I'm telling you this because it changed dramatically my response rate. My response rate when we went electronic hovered around 13%. 14%. And once I changed this to five points of extra credit, if I got a 100% response rate, I now get a 100% response rate. Some of my colleagues do it a little differently. They'll give five points extra credit for 80% response rate and 10 points for 100%. I'm an all or nothing type of person. Everyone gets five points if you get, if I get 100% response rate. And you'll see that the students are often, you know, telling them, telling each other, fill it out on the phone, you know, do it now, I really need those five points. And, and like, as I said, since I went to that method, five points, no skin off my back, but I have a 100% response rate. So I'm not, you know, people often say, well, don't teach necessarily to the, to the, uh, to the evaluation, but it is important to understand, um, I've been on, as I said, the promotion committee, we here at SHIP, we call it a three-legged stool to get promoted. We have teaching, publications, service. That's the three-legged stool. And they're to be generally even and equal. But if you have poor teaching evaluations, that doesn't, that tends to drag you down. And there's, uh, on the promotion committee, people don't respond well if you are pointing to outside factors other than your teaching to explain poor evaluations. So, for example, there's studies that show women, uh, people of color, people who, for whom English is not their native language, there's implicit bias there um, and when students fill out teaching evaluations. But it never behooves the applicant, the promotion applicant, to point that out. Like I just have found generally people are aware of, of those obstacles and many people have different obstacles in terms of teaching. So what you want to do is if your teaching evaluations are initially poor, you want to show how you took proactive steps to change them. And some, I have a colleague who, who flipped their whole class. They did that to, to change their teaching evaluations. I did this, the Socratic method and essay exams only, and it worked. Whatever works for you, I find that people will respond positively to any proactive um, action on your part to change uh, poor poor numbers, uh, teaching teams, outside consulting, something, something than just saying, well, they don't like me anyway. My subject, the subject I teach is hated. It's hard, and um, um, and you know they were going to ding me for that. Okay, so um, this is. Uh, just uh, another, this is, I say, you have some fun when you write essay exams, you can uh, use your, your local, your local uh, community. Um, and uh, this is a law exam, again, which is my specialty, and I use the IRAC method. Uh, this is a common method in law school, but anyone can use it. Uh, there's an issue a rule, an application, and a conclusion. And uh, here uh, you'll see this is one of my students' response. The issue is the question, the rule. This is a rule of law, but it can be any principle that you are teaching. This isn't just um, for law classes. It's any principle of the class that you're covering. And the application is the heart of the essay. That's the most important piece. This is where most of the points are, 15 points for this where the student analyzes the hypothetical or, and applies the class principles to the facts that you gave them in the question. And um, as I say, it, it really, they feel good about it, which will make you feel good about it. And um, uh, I'm sure that if you even just make a, a few little changes, your teaching evaluations will improve. So thank you so much, and I will entertain questions. Perfect. All right, everybody. Um, thank you so much for your presentation today, Stephanie. That was fantastic. So we will move along to our Q&A session. 
Again, we're answering questions that have come into the Q&A box um, to the right or bottom of the main presentation screen, or those that have come from Twitter using the hashtag SageTalks. So please feel free to continue to add questions in those places. Um, the first question that we have is, do you ever do mixed exams, essays, multiple choice, true, true false for in-person classes or just for your online courses? Uh, for online only. Uh, when I'm teaching person in face-to-face, -face, I only use essay, essay exams. Um, okay. And that's because, um, uh, and this is perhaps selfish, but online isn't part of our load. Um, so uh, it's, it's sort of like extra. Um, and I find that I can't, I cannot have that type of engagement with the student to get them to understand some of the finer nuances that really makes the essay exam applicable. Because when you're online, it's typically all book uh, that, you know, they, I, it's open book exams for the most part. And so um, they're getting their knowledge more for the book, from the book, for their tests. And so um, I, I, it's a mix and, and not, not exclusively essay. So to answer your question, face-to-face -face is when I use exclusive essay. And thank you for your question. Perfect. Great. Um, another question. Do you, re do you recommend limiting the time of lecturing per session to a certain amount, say 20 minutes, given attention span issues? Uh, I don't. Um, I teach 75 minute classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I use all 75 minutes. But what I find is what breaks up the attention is when you use the Socratic method and the student gives an answer, it is much easier than to riff off that answer with other students. As I said before, like Pete says, oh, police uh, serve and protect. And then I'll say, Sally, give us an example of that. And then I can say, John, give us another example. And I can say, oh, write this down. Or uh, if, it's, if that's too much, I then turn to the book um, and I'll say, let's turn to page 15 and I need you to write this principle down. And that sort of breaks it up. Um, uh, so that the 75 minutes actually goes pretty easily, but it's not just me lecturing. Well, I found when I use the PowerPoint slides in class, all I did was lecture and all they did was write. And we had no discussion whatsoever because they were so paranoid about missing any, any word on the slide presented. So I, I, I break it up that way through, through um, the students answering the questions or writing stuff down or reading stuff from the book or, or reading material. Thank you for your question. Perfect. Um, any other suggestions for adapting this method for large classes? Yes. So when I teach at a law school, it's a, it's a large class. I'm never going to be able to call on everyone, but I do use the magic cup. And, I, and so, like I said, everyone has to be prepared, but I don't put their names back in the cup. So, you know, the drawback is if I, if I call on Laurie today, she knows I'm not going to get to her on Thursday in a class of 500. But one of the things I do, and I'm not sure if this is, uh, you have this technology, is we have headsets and handsets. And I actually, like Oprah, I actually move from in front of the class because, again, I'm not using slides. Uh, I'm, let me just say this. I'm not using slides with material. I do use slides and video clips to illuminate uh, concepts that I'm talking about in class, but not material for them to write down. I'm either saying it or I'm planting for a student to, to, you know, to give me a response that we can say or from the book itself. So I'm able to walk up and down the aisles and I am, and I can tend to then focus on a student more closely. And when you get close to them, um, you know, and you do that regularly, they know you're going to come around and eventually you're going to get to these people. But I don't change what I do based on my audience or the content. Like I do the same thing all the time. I use the Socratic method. I use essay exams, except, of course, with the exception of online. When I'm face to face, whether it's I teach the same, whether it's 10 people 
or 500, I'm going to do the same thing. So it, it's not the greatest, but it is adaptable. And you'll find that when you're getting close to the student in that way, and they know you're going to call on at least 20 students a class, that everyone else is listening. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, do you tell them about your method in your syllabus? What is important to put in your syllabus? I do not tell them uh, my method in my syllabus. Oh, I do tell them. I don't tell them about the Socratic method. I do tell them about the essay exams and I give a basic uh, general rubric for how I grade them. So, for example, that IRAC um, example that I gave you, the issue was worth three points. And that's just my question. It's the easiest three points they're going to get, you know, is who's who's responsible for the crime. The rules are five points uh, and they they have to know what the rules are. And the application is 15 points. That's the most important piece is that's the heart of the essay. I let them know that's 15 points. And then the uh, conclusion is two points and it's just an answer to the issue. Who, you know, who's responsible for the crime? Conclusion, Fred. So I do tell them that. I do tell them how I approach grading in the essay format, but I don't necessarily tell them I'm going to call on each and every one of them. Although I, I will say my syllabus does not have any participation points because it doesn't matter to me uh, because I'm going to call on everybody. And the students who constantly raise their hand, I am constantly gesturing for them to put their hands down um, because, you know, they, they come from classes where the more you talk, the more points you get. And that's not in my class. And that's perhaps because I have a military background and I tell them I treat everybody the same. And so everybody has an opportunity to talk. And once students know their voice matters, they really do become much more engaged. But I don't tell them that. Um, I also tell you the truth, I don't have an attendance policy. Um, but the flip side of that is I don't have a makeup policy. And I, you know, I sometimes run into problems with that. Of course, you know, of course, makeup policy for just general things that people miss because they're not feeling well. Those types of things don't constitute an, an emergency. Obviously, I, obviously, makeups for death and military orders or university events. But I don't take attendance. And um, because the class itself, if you miss one of these classes, because of how engaging it is with everybody in class, you really do miss a lifetime of, of, of material. So I find that the, the class regulates itself that way. Great. Um, someone asked, do you have rubrics that you are willing to share? Yes, I do. Okay. And uh, there's my email, uh, or I guess I'm going to send you, uh, uh, there yeah, there is it is. The email. Yep. Please do. I'm willing to help and coach anybody through this process because obviously uh, I'm a trial attorney, so it was a little easier for me with the Socratic method because I had been a student uh, through it. But it was very uncomfortable for me to start with a bunch of, of sort of, uh, uh, I won't call them hostile, but when I first came, just students were not used to being held accountable and responsible for their own learning which is what the Socratic method does. It makes them responsible. And um, so there was much resistance. You know, I've had students come up to me and say, I can't learn. I need it. I need PowerPoints. You know, and I, I said, well, I list them. I give you, you all of them. I, I you know, I, I, I load them all up on day one, all 14 chapters, like have at it, download them, bring them to class. And usually students are very, very appreciative of, of that of having them there and then being able to write directly on them. And they're not so stressed, uh, not listening to you, trying to write everything down. Mm -hmm. I actually have a question regarding that. It says, do you use publisher provided resources still? I worry about having all my PowerPoints done at the beginning of class. Yes. Yes, I use, I, of course, since I, I use, <laughs> since I wrote this, uh, the, the main class that I teach in, I wrote the book and all the PowerPoints. So yes, I use, <laughs> I use the, the, the publisher provided because I wrote them. Um, mm -hmm. But even if you don't have all 14 chapters, if you could just upload the ones that you plan to use for that lecture before the class, then you can use sort of visual aids and video clips, because it's also why this is fun for professors and instructors is you get to keep up with what's 
happening with the with the students what's what's the latest fashion what you know what who are they following on twitter really is there is what is that with taylor swift and britney spears like what is what is going on and and if you're scouring sort of the the public uh domain for things to use in class to make it more relevant to them uh you can that's what that's what the powerpoints in class can be used for to illuminate certain concepts and they really like that and for the content the meat the nuts and the bolts in terms of what you're giving on a powerpoint slide only you know you can do it per lecture as long as you do it before the lecture and let them know that they'll be able to download it and bring it to class to write their notes on so don't feel compelled you need a whole semester's worth like like i do all right and i think the last question that we have time for um do you let's see do you do the essay exams for even your midterms and your finals yes i do and i give a comprehensive final in every class i never i i you know i never not give a comprehensive final because again i want the students and i'm training them to be professionals and um uh i'm training them to be able to sort of see the building blocks of what we learned in the first uh, day of class all the way till the end and I tell them that and since this is the last question I'll share with you one technique that I've used that I have found helpful because you don't want the students to feel overwhelmed and then not like you and then that will be reflected in your teaching evaluations for some classes I allow the students uh, let's say I assign chapter one I allow the students to put any notes they want about chapter one's reading on a on the front of a three by five note card. Any any notes they want. Some of the kids, students, they'll they'll type out like a negative five font. They'll type out the whole chapter, which you know they realize later they can't read. And on the back of the three by five card, they put their name and the chapter. Now this is always due the first thing in class after. I assign the reading. I've assigned chapter one. The next day in class, I collect these note cards. For tests only, not quizzes, I will allow them to use these note cards as sort of a cheat sheet. Now, let me, let me just say this. They are prohibited from putting any class notes from my lecture on the note cards. Should anyone do that, I, I end the entire card program. So it's an honor system, but they they're limited to what is in the reading and what this does is it gives them motivation to do some of the reading so i can lecture a little bit more quickly um, it it alleviates some of their anxiety about the essays because they at least have some touchstone with the note card but most students tell me the note cards are really not that helpful because by the time the test comes around uh, they perhaps have forgotten what's on their note card. Uh, one of the student, my one student suggested with this method that students take photographs of the note cards before they turn them in. Uh, it can only be one side of the note card, and it only is from the book. And usually, uh, and I give quizzes, and uh, uh, like I say, I have these tests. And for the comprehensive final, those students who have done the note cards, and I don't accept late cards, I don't accept any late work, and I'm willing to share this, my syllabi with you as well for you to see this. Um, it really is just like a little security blanket. And one professor asked me, one colleague said, well, aren't you afraid that the student during the final is going to whip out a bunch of note cards? You know, that could happen. I mean, I, I run, I look around and I'm sort of walking around. Do, do I know if a student, you know, did all note cards, you know, one through five, uh, or they, they're sort of pulling something out? Um, I find that those, that, that the threat of that happening was not enough to deter me for using this method because I did find that it was helpful in the end, especially for a comprehensive final. Okay, well, I thank you so very much. Please keep in touch. Ask me any questions. I'm willing to help. I'm willing to send you any of my materials if this can improve uh, the way um, that your classes go. Again, I appreciate it.
Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was great. And thank you everybody for, jo for joining us today for today's Sage Talk. Please be on the lookout for an email that includes a link to view this entire webinar on our website, as well as some answers to some of the questions that we don't, did not have time to get to today or anything that comes into us after this webinar takes place. Thanks for your attention and we hope you will all join us for another Sage Talk webinar again soon. You can visit sagepub.com slash sage talks for more information. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.